Good evening. My name is Peter Sharoshi. I'm the editor of the Drug Reporter website and the director of the Rights Reporter Foundation. Thank you for joining uh, our new live uh, video show today. Uh, we hope this will be the first episode of a series. So we launched this series to show the world how uh, this current uh, COVID-19 crisis affects the most uh, marginalized groups uh, of our society, uh, such as people who use drugs. Uh, our guests uh, here today are helping these people in the front lines. Uh, so let me uh, introduce uh, uh, our guests. Uh, I, I have the pleasure to have uh, uh, Dominika Yasikova from uh, Bratislava, Slovakia here, from uh, the harm reduction NGO uh, Odysseus. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, we have uh, David Pesek from uh, uh, Prague, Czech Republic, who is uh, leading the contact center of Sananim, which is the, the largest uh, drug service provider uh, in the Czech Republic. Hi, David. Hello. Nice to be here. And I hope soon uh, we will be joined by uh, Pavel Ben, uh, who is the former mayor of Prague and uh, as well a, a community psychiatrist. Uh, and uh, Hello. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, Pavel here. Hi, Pavel. And uh, thank you for, uh, thank you again for being available and joining, uh, joining us now. So before we start to speak about the epidemic itself and, in, and its uh, effects, can you guys please tell me uh, before, uh, uh, what did you do before the crisis uh, happened and uh, what kind of services did you provide for uh, vulnerable people? Uh, how was your life before, before the epidemic? Uh, okay, let's start with Dominika. Hello everyone again. Thanks for invitation, Peter. So, um, Odysseus is an organization based in Bratislava and we are basically harm reduction service provider. Uh, we provide needle exchange outreach in, in Bratislava streets and also we have drop in at the only open drug scene called Pentagon in Bratislava. Then apart from in exchange, we are providing these uh, typical services, harm reduction services, like testing for hep C, HIV or syphilis, counseling, and also social assistance services, um, where we are accompanying our clients to police, hospitals, um, and other, um, other, other services. And also last year we started with uh, social assistance to doctors by car for uh, for disabled clients. And uh, apart from this, we work also with uh, young young people in in the environment of parties and festivals. So that's quite a lot, even even without this crisis. So there was a lot of uh, workload on you. Uh, okay, so let's go to uh, Pavel. Can you explain us how was your life before the epidemic? Can we start with uh, David uh, to All right. sure. introduce the Sana name uh, activities uh, and interventions and then just I might probably add uh, something from my perspective. Good, great. So let, go ahead, David. Well, uh, before the crisis, uh, we, we were in a regular crisis mode as, uh, it's, as it's usual for the NGO sector in the uh, Czech Republic. So uh, like always, we are uh, struggling for financing, for some stable financing for our uh, uh, services and uh, trying uh, to advocacy toward uh, a broader uh, amount of uh, possibilities for our clients, for people who use drugs. And uh, that's something uh, we, we are advocating for, uh, for uh, many years. And uh, we are trying also to be as uh, progressive as, as we can. Uh, Sananim, Sananim NGO is uh, founded in uh, 1990, right after the Velvet Revolution, and uh, we are uh, probably the biggest provider of uh, drug services in Czech Republic. 
meaning from uh, harm reduction services, from outreach work, from really low threshold facilities. Also, we provide OST, we provide all kinds of uh, counseling, ambulant care. We have uh, therapeutic communities, uh, aftercare, some social enterprise, uh, and uh, so on. So, so the uh, the services we provide are, are a lot. We have more than uh, 6,000 clients per year. And uh, yeah, we exchange uh, almost 2 million of uh, needle and syringes in, in one year. And uh, I could uh, say more and more numbers, but uh, uh, let's keep it. That's, that's quite right impressive. It's very impressive, especially looking from Hungary that you, you exchange two million needles a year. That's quite a lot. Pavel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yes. If I may add, uh, I think uh, Sunanem represents probably 25, maybe 30 percent of uh, the overall HR interventions uh, in the country, including the needle exchange schemes and uh, HIV and hepatitis C testing. Uh, my uh, understanding is uh, that, uh, as David said at the beginning, uh, the financial management of HR services uh, is a crucial one. However, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, we have been able in the past 20 years to stabilize the system in a way of uh, multi-source uh, financial management that means that uh, from various sources, including the municipal and the state and uh, some uh, sponsors, uh, the money are covering uh, the activities in quite well status. Certainly COVID uh, pandemic and uh, the state of uh, irregular world, which we are now just placed in, is changing everything, but this is Peter something probably which uh, you will open uh, in uh, next uh, time. I should also say that uh, I am a COVID positive. <laughs> so I'm uh, in quarantine as uh, David said uh, 10 minutes ago. And fortunately, I am absolutely healthy. I don't uh, feel anything. I don't have any symptoms. Uh, uh, probably I'm one of those, probably many of many uh, of those uh, uh, who are undergoing through the asymptomatic uh, progress of uh, the disorder of the, the infection. And uh, I hope it will stay uh, <laughs> during the time and uh, I even might uh, be currently uh, immune uh, and I might be one of those who underwent the infection in a uh, very uh, early stage and uh, could, let's say, uh, share some of my experience. Uh, how do I see the pandemic from uh, the uh, HR perspective. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to hear that uh, you are living with the COVID virus now. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I'm glad to hear that you have no symptoms. I hope it will stay this way. So uh, what we see on social media, you know, see that what, how, how this uh, crisis affects uh, uh, middle-class people like you know, self-isolation and staying home. And you hear this message a lot. Uh, but how does this uh, crisis affect uh, people who live on the street, uh, marginalized people who use drugs, those people who you work with uh, on the street? Uh, can you can you a bit speak about that? Like how did this uh, epidemic and the lockdown change the way of life of people living on the street? Dominic, can you speak about that in, in, in Bratislava? Uh, so, the if we are speaking about about the drug market or uh, drug supply, until now, we don't see any difference. 
we um, our clients are not reporting any of this but um, we heard something from the other organizations working mostly with um, homeless people in the old town that um, they experience um, lack of supply but like to us the, it um, hasn't gotten yet but i think that it's um it's a question of a few weeks like i think that it's too soon here that is still uh, quite too early but what we see in our services and uh it's that um, our clients are really in need for for food and water uh before we we were not providing hot meals or any this, this type of services because um, our clients they they didn't need that much but now we feel that it's real real issue and real, real struggle to get to the to the water and to and to food because you the due to the closure of uh, of almost everything they lost uh, they they cannot even enter to shopping centers to maybe go to the toilet or drink water and also they lost uh, their ways of um, earning money some people were maybe earning money by selling things on the streets or begging uh, people so they don't have money and they don't have uh, also food and water this is what we see like a real struggle right now and also uh, the lack of uh, protective gear but i think it's like it's normal in this situation because it's there is a lack also in normal market and um, also the protective gear and um, yeah I, uh, one more thing but and also the disinfection of hands or the hygiene like it's really difficult to uh, to do a basic hygiene for them mm. so we are also providing some disinfection gels or things mm -hmm. is it the same in prague david peter have you uh, have you ever been in prague of course. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you of course know that uh, Prague is like a really, really touristic uh, city. People all around, sightseeing, uh, all the culture and the history in the center. We have plenty of that. Uh, now, now imagine a really empty city with no tourists, everybody at home and uh, just uh, people who use drugs and uh, homeless people on the streets. So it's a completely different uh, view of the city uh, these, uh, these days. And uh, now imagine that a lot of these people are used to, uh, of because of their poor situation, are used to back uh, the tourists and, and people for some money, for some food, or, or looking in the trash for finding some some junk, finding some uh, cigarettes on the streets, and, and now there is uh, nothing. So uh, uh, our our people are really used to live in a crowded city, and now now the city is empty. So that's that's the biggest difference. And now you hear from from the TV from everybody: go home, be with your relatives, stay safe. Uh, which is like if you don't have uh, these values it's uh, it's totally stressful to hear all the day how how you should be with, at the home with your close uh, closest people when all you have is uh, the street and really no relatives so it's uh, it's tough times it's tough times for the whole community and uh, uh, we are really struggling a lot and trying uh, trying to help. Uh, so uh, one of uh, the biggest things is uh, finding some sheltering. And uh, the other thing is the OST, uh, because uh, imagine closed borders. So there is uh, much less of uh, substances, uh, much less uh, trafficking of heroin, much less trafficking of precursors uh, to make, to cook uh, crystal meth and uh, uh, things like this. So uh, the, the drug market is getting uh, more expensive 
because there is less substances uh, on the market and uh, the most vulnerable group of, uh, of the community is much uh, more poor than they were uh, in, the, in the past. So there is like a huge uh, gap getting a huge, huge disbalance. And that's, uh, that's really a key issue nowadays, uh, how to help people uh, with this issue. We really need to uh, get much bigger OST, uh, opioid substitution treatment, but we are also thinking about stu stimulant uh, substitution treatment because we are one of the uh, biggest uh, consumers of uh, methamphetamine in, in Europe. So that's, uh, uh, and I could talk about more and more things, but these are uh, the two biggest. Paolo, do you think that these changes in the drug market will be uh, long-term changes or everything will just go back to normal after the lockdown is over? Actually, as we know, the black market uh, is able to find the way to the sources of new substances and new, new, new channels, excuse me, uh, new channels uh, very uh, rapidly. So my guess is that uh, we will probably observe uh, significant changes in the channels uh, and in interventions actually and the measures of uh, black market and uh, drug supply. But currently is uh, the, the description provided by, by David is uh, absolutely precise. So I think uh, we are really just now confronted with the fact that for the first time in the history, the borders are really closed and uh, the traditional or standard channels and chains of the black market is affected significantly. And uh, it brings a, a lot of risks from the public health perspective in uh, services we are delivering uh, to our clients. So uh, probably I think in the first time in the history uh, of uh, modern history, I mean of uh, our country, we have been sig seriously discussing uh, two days ago or three days ago, uh, how should we convince the Czech government in order to open the space for the legitimate and not off label, but standardized substitution treatment within uh, the low threshold and HR services with the legal uh, stimulant like substances for let's say 35 users of methamphetamine in the Czech Republic. And I'm talking about Ritalin and Stratera and Dexamphetamine. Uh, Certainly all these substances are somehow and very in a quite more and more common manner used in off label. That means that uh, I would be prescribing for certain uh, clients uh, based on uh, my assessment uh, in terms of minimizing the risk and standardize the client. But uh, openly, I would hardly be able to advocate for this within uh, the, for example, the medical chamber, uh, within the ethical commission of uh, the uh, public health service providers. Uh, so. This is one of aspects uh, which from my perspective is an open window or a challenge. So I totally agree with David that the, the drug supply and the black market is changing. And uh, part of this change are risks of uh, new 
synthetic uh, drugs uh, with uh, unknown quality, with uh, higher mortality and morbidity risks. The other aspect is the need to search for interventions which could somehow substitute some of services which are limited by the restrictions. So our low threshold treatment centers, contact centers, drop-in centers, and outreach is providing the needle exchange schemes, but the additional services like counseling, for example, etc., are limited and to certain extent restricted or even banned by the government. So we are trying to search for some alternatives. Mm. What, from certain perspective, the, for example, substitution treatment uh, with very low threshold as far as opioid users are concerned, or substitution treatment uh, through Ritalin, Stratera, Dexamphetamine substitution for stimulant users. And this is exactly uh, something uh, what uh, we are confronted with and trying to get through the system. So we can say actually that this uh, epidemic also opens some new possibilities to break down some of the barriers which uh, uh, actually were, uh, uh, were unnecessary even before the crisis. Uh, David, you, you sign all that you want to add uh, something to that? Just uh, uh, one little note. This gap, this dangerous gap, can be the biggest risk. We are afraid of uh, raising of uh, new psychoactive substances, which can uh, which can be used uh, for stimulant users like this alpha PVP catenons and and all all, all this stuff. And uh, someone could also use this gap on the black market uh, to bring some fentanyl and some other pop potent opioids. So this is the biggest risk and the, and the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity we should uh, take now and uh, advocate toward the government is uh, to, ma to make the substitution treatment as most available as, as possible. And that mm -hmm. can be uh, now a strong opportunity to do this because the situation can get uh, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's let's uh, look at Slovakia because Slovakia was not uh, as progressive in terms of uh, harm reduction as the Czech Republic. Um, and Dominika, what do you think is 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 this crisis also uh, gives you a new window of opportunity to maybe to change the rules of OST and to maybe to broaden uh, OST programs? Um, and how 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 did it change uh, the way how it is uh, how it is uh, how it is proceeded now? Well, to be honest, um, I don't really think that there will be a possibility to advocate for OST or for broader use of OST. The OST is um, quite problematic in Slovakia and we are not as progressive as uh, our neighbors <laughs> from Czech Republic. And um, basically the, the OST is not available really in most of the cities in Slovakia, to be honest. The methadone program is available just in two big cities, in two uh, centers for um, for the treatment. And then the, um, the Suboxone or Nalox uh, is available theoretically in every psychiatry um, clinic but or ambulance. But we know that the psychiatrists, they don't want to prescribe this uh, this treatment and it's really difficult to actually find one so this is a really difficult task mm -hmm. okay and yeah and also like last year we faced um, really crisis because uh, there was a lack of um, of um, suboxone 
in Slovak market and we were getting tele phone calls or mails from from people all around the, of Slovakia which had like which were uh, had jobs kids home like people completely integrated into society and they were calling us like what what they can do like the they have treatment just for two weeks and then there is nothing in Slovakia and the doctors they know nothing and it was really difficult and the situation was that we had like two distributors of uh, this treatment and the Slovakia is small market so one distributor left and the another one didn't expect this so they didn't provide us with enough of, of of the treatment so it was like um, we didn't have it maybe for like one or two months so so um you know how the one way how the the o o opiate substitution pro programs cope with this new crisis is that they, they uh, prescribe a take home a longer take home doses for the clients but I also hear reports that this actually uh, ha has its own problems. Like, you know, clients were not used to economize on drugs for a longer time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Pava, can you speak about that? That how, how can, how can uh, OST programs manage this problem? Like, how can you support clients, you know, not to overdose your drugs? How can you prevent that? Or how can you uh, help them to, uh, you know, to, uh, keep the uh, doses as it is prescribed for a longer time? Uh, Peter, this is a good question, actually. Uh, first of all, I think uh, even though uh, the system in most of European countries react on the COVID, uh, COVID uh, epidemic uh, in a sort of a panic manner, uh, in uh, from many perspective and I, i'm just now talking about the public health and i'm talking about the prevention perspective uh, many of these restrictive interventions are nonsense and very likely will have to be stopped otherwise the public health social system and the economics of the states would be just in total collapse. So my understanding currently actually is that we have and we need to keep the services in as much as possible working order. That means uh, hardly we can go against the restrictions but we need to merge at the maximum of possibilities in other words we need to keep not only needle exchange schemes but the face-to-face -face contacts with our, cli our clients we need to inform them and probably raise an awareness not only about COVID and about the public health measures, about the protection, for example, uh, about the need to use the disinfection and how to use the disinfection in, even though they would be homeless. Even in these absurd living contexts where we have to think how can we teach our clients to use an elementary hygienic uh, measures as far as the COVID is concerned. But at the same time, it gives us the chance to, for example, talk with them about uh, the risks of providing them with uh, higher doses of uh, Suboxone or Ritalin or Stratera and providing them with the information on 
risks and uh, from my perspective the number one uh, issue is uh, to return to so-called standard or normal context of service delivery or at least to get as much close to it as possible. Second, to it's a chance for, for us uh, to think about uh, the ethics and the methodology and uh, uh, about the standards, for example, of uh, the, well, if we start to talk about uh, the provision of amphetamine user substitution treatment, okay, we have never get so far to define standards of this care. We can try to do it. And as we know, uh, the COVID pandemic is pushing the health providers to experiment. So we started to experiment with, I don't know, Plaquenil and Remdesivir and, and other uh, pharmacological, pharmaceutical substances. And the same is true for us as far as HR services are concerned. So I think it's open time for experiment. So I don't have, uh, I would say, uh, well-defined set of recommendations, but uh, one of general recommendation would be just, yes, let's experiment. Mm -hmm. Let's open the space for experiments, even though, as for example, Dominica said, okay, we have troubles with methadone and we have troubles with uh, suboxone. Okay. So in the Czech Republic, we started in the early 90s with the substitution treatment to opioid users with uh, codeine derivatives. Okay. Uh, it was not definitely the best possible idea to do it. But for example, Diolan or Diolan was a codeine containing medicine, which was the first broadly used substitution drug for opioid users. So the suggestion for the Slovak Republic would be just, okay, look which uh, codeine containing substances you do have on the legal market and simply do it. Start to do it. Give a courage to the professionals, to uh, health providers, to psychiatrists, or even GPs to, to simply do it. So uh, my suggestion number one is to experiment. It's just really time to open our mind for certainly safe experiments. Uh, and uh, when I use the word safe, I am a little bit hesitating to define what even do I mean by that, but there is uh, some ethic and there definitely are many imperatives behind harm reduction uh, philosophy. So suggestion number one is experiment. Suggestion number two is uh, permanent monitoring of uh, what we are doing, even though we are introducing a, a new measures. The third, if some of services are being lost because of the bans and state restrictions, just we should replace them by something else. Mm. For example, it's crazy, but I started to communicate with some of my HR clients by mobile phones. And certainly you say, okay, 
what is new here? The new here is that I provided old mobiles to three of my clients. Just I found the three old mobiles, paid the credit, and having the chance now to be in contact with them. Mm. This is absolutely non-standard intervention, but I think you have to try. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's uh, not standard, but actually very, very much uh, in line with the philosophy of harm reduction, which is like exactly you, know, you, you have to provide your clients what they really need at, at, at they are. And uh, I just heard about a very interesting initiative from Barcelona, for example, where the harm reduction programs now they are setting up uh, uh, cell phone recharging points for homeless people. You know, that's okay, exactly. you have a phone, but that you can't recharge that because supermarkets are shopping malls are closed. So they just set up these points so people can keep their uh, social uh, networks there. Um, Dominic, I, I, I know that you just met with your uh, local government uh, not so so long time ago. So, uh, can I ask you, like, to explain, like, what when you go to your government, um, in reflecting to what Pavel said about experimentation. So, what do you what do you what do you say? What do you tell them? Like, what are your main needs, uh, and uh, uh, and how open uh, you you feel that uh, your government is to your ideas? So if we talk about the state and uh, state government, so the help or the the, um, um, the help is none and they they are not listening and they don't want to listen. But when we are speaking about the city government, city of Bratislava, uh, there is um, we have a communication and but this communication is um, mostly focused on uh, homeless people and um, we are on call like the the uh, organizations which work with homeless people and we are there also for the community of homeless drug users and uh, we are on calls twice or once a week on i think for three weeks or one month already and the um, yeah and we are uh, because for city is crucial that we our services are intact and that we are keep going in the same amount or even in higher higher capacity or more services so they they are doing all what they can to to help us so they are providing us with the uh, protective equipment for for us and also for our clients uh also uh they are setting up um a quarantine city for 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 homeless people this is this will be like um mm, uh, like a city for 30 up to 100 people who are homeless and they and uh, they cannot go to quarantine at home because they don't have uh, so they can they can go to this quarantine city and wait for the for the testings or if they are already positive then can they can stay there and and cure there there will be provide uh, like food and all the services what is the problem is um is um, the, the needs of people who use drugs. Uh, because this, this, uh, this quarantine, quarantine city will not be low threshold. So the people who enter then they cannot uh, like leave, come and go as they please. So, and they will be isolated there. So we need to speak about the possibilities, how they can survive there and not suffer there because it's not, it's not voluntary detox and they are like it i and it sh they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't uh, request for them like the abstinence if they don't want to so until now we we know that people who are who are already in substitution treatment so it will be okay 
that they will have their substitution treatment even there. But for active drug users who don't, who are not on substitution treatment, it will be difficult. There will be although GP and psychiatrists, but they they cannot um, prescribe substitution treatment. They just can prescribe something which can relieve them from the withdrawal symptoms or help help them. So this will be difficult and we are still in the process of managing. The quarantine city is not open yet because uh, they need to finish with um, hiring of the staff. But I hope it will be possible. Also, we are discussing about the um, um, finding some way how to communicate or how to connect with the uh, people who are testing or if we have some symptomatic client like it's really difficult right now like if you meet if um, we have clients who has symptoms we need to call 155 and sometimes the workers are five hours on the call and waiting for instructions or waiting for for something and and this is not a uh, this is not not good because the clients are not waiting or for them is impossible to maybe stay five hours with us and also the services are limited sometimes they need to go to other place so this we need to we need to find some effective way we are also in contact with the with the doctors who are um, uh, uh, who are in charge of uh, the testing in front of hospital in one tent so maybe we can call them directly or there will be some po a possibility to uh, to call them and they will provide uh, the transport. And also the city built three hygienic stations in city in the uh, in areas where the homeless people are um, normally during the day. So it's it built it was built like last week and probably since tomorrow there will be also uh, um, a soap <laughs> so they'll be able to clean hands uh, also with the soap so the cooperation is is good uh, we need to we need to but we need to think more about the drug users and about their needs and i think that this is the thing which is not solved yet and which is not um, taking into con consideration that much because of course the community of drug users who are homeless are um, smaller than the community of drug users who drink uh, alcohol or who don't use uh, illegal substances. So yeah, and the city needs to think in the bigger perspective. Yeah, definitely. The, the how to deal with homeless people, I think it's a key issue uh, here. Uh, David, can you speak about how uh, the city of Prague uh, deals with this uh, uh, issue? I've heard that you also have some outdoor uh, facilities for homeless people. Uh, what are the challenges, opportunities over there? To be, uh, to be sincere, Prague is uh, and uh, the Prague NGOs are doing uh, quite uh, great uh, work uh, regarding uh, finding uh, solutions for the for the homeless people. Uh, probably it's a shame that the the pandemic is teaching us how we should cope uh, with the situation that is already here for many years. But it's uh, uh, nowadays, it's like uh, you can see it more. As I said, the, the, the people, the community of uh, people using drugs and the homeless people is uh, almost the only people you, you see in the city. So now, now you like realize uh, more that's a problem, but uh, this problem uh, or this issue is here uh, for so long time. And no nowadays there is this focus uh, on, uh, on helping uh, these people, uh, which we are uh, advocating for many years and we are quite uh, successful, but still there are some ach achievements nowadays that, uh, that are really great. Uh, there was uh, the possibility to open some camps that are usually for uh, tourist people, for the backpackers with the tents. 
which are now, of course, uh, totally empty. So uh, they can be used um, for homeless people to uh, to build a tent there uh, with a sleeping bag, uh, which uh, we can uh, also provide to those people. And there is like Salvation Army and uh, other other NGOs uh, running uh, these places. And there is uh, warm food and. Um, good background for, for the people. Uh, of course, you, we would like, uh, for example, to have uh, some of these uh, camps or shelters uh, connected uh, with the substitution treatments, connected with harm reduction services. And we are working on that, uh, on educating the staff uh, working there and uh, mm, so it would be possible. It's not only about camps, it's also about uh, hostels or hotels that are suddenly available for, uh, for our, uh, our uh, community. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the model uh, we, we have seen in London and, uh, and other cities. Uh, there is also this possibility to for uh, with these power banks that can uh, that can uh, people like borrow and exchange them like uh, full with energy for the possible use of uh, mobiles and 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 the progress is quite good uh, now, now nowadays now, nowadays so uh, it's it's interesting for me for me for for, for a person who is advocating for so many years uh, in the in the field of the drug community is uh, is quite an interesting uh, time nowadays full of opportunities uh, that uh, must be must be taken and there is the possibility to make uh, the drug policy more progressive let's hope so but uh, uh, Maybe maybe Pavel should talk after me. He will be more uh, critic. He will he will tell you more about uh, the sessions with uh, politicians and so on. How uh, difficult uh, that is. Uh, so. Okay. So there is this ambivalence. I'm happy. I'm happy, David, that you don't didn't lose your uh, optimism. So you see <laughs> the future uh, in a bright color. Uh, what about the others, Pavel? Are you are you optimistic or more uh, skeptical about the future? Can uh, can our governments learn from this crisis something? Oh, definitely, I agree with David that uh, we should learn uh, from this crisis. Uh, from uh, for me, the key question is uh, looking at the COVID pre prevention and intervention measures. And on the other side, looking at certain restrictions which are affecting our services. And from harm reduction perspective, the key question is, okay, for our clients, are these restrictions or prevention measures introduced? providing more harm or less harm compared to the standardized service delivery. And uh, from this, I guess we are simply confronted with much more harm, which is associated with current state. So I definitely agree with David that the optimism and energy uh, for, uh, let's say, experiments and some voluntary uh, services and uh, reunions of people and services, this is lovely. And this is uh, very promising. On the other hand, we have to be aware of the fact that the current status is also putting our clients from many 
perspectives in danger. And, uh, and we should intervene. And we should, as I already said, try to replace the missing services by some alternatives, as well as all these experiments and the new services and new ideas should just uh, be in place. So I am somehow a little bit optimistic also as David is, but at the same time, I see a lot of collateral harm, which is associated with the political decisions made by the government or by the state authorities. And I'm very much afraid that if the time of all these non-standard interventions and restrictions, if the time lasts too long, I'm very much afraid of the high probability that there will be so much collateral damages affecting the economics, thus also affecting the social and health status of the society, that there will be a lack of public resources for everything. And considering the options or just the high probability of uh, financial shortages in general in the system or in the economics of our countries. My great threat is that the first who will be affected by that are harm reduction services delivering services to drug users. So looking at what is going to happen in fall, September, October, we might be confronted and I don't want to be a prophet of the bad news. Definitely, I am optimist by my uh, psychological status and lifestyle. However, uh, I think we should take in our discussions the likelihood that uh, there will be a significant effects on HR service delivery uh, during next month because simply of the collapse of our state economics. Yeah, thank you, David, uh, Pavel. And uh, what's, uh, what about you, Dominica? How do you feel about the future? Yeah, I would like to add one thing. Um, what uh, Pavel said, uh, that I feel the same about the harms, uh, because um, for what I see, there is a um, lot of hatred uh, and the society stigmatizing the vulnerable people even more right now. We can see it in our um, drop-in in Pentagon where the open drug scene is and there are people also living on Oops, like I think we are now is okay yeah i think now it's better yeah okay so um, now i can see that the society is even more stigmatizing the people who use drugs or the other vulnerable communities the um, they um, in Pentagon, where is the open drug scene, and the people are actually living there in this location where uh, it's residential area. So the people are um, 
really they are quite frustrated and angry with them. They are scared of them that uh, they can bring the, uh, them infections and all. And but on the other side, when you are providing them hygiene, uh, masks, and all this, all these things, they are jealous. Like ah, so they are you are giving this to homeless people, and to me, no one is giving it. So there is this um, discrepancy. And on the and also I can see there is more solidarity from the individuals, like a lot of people now are volunteering. Uh, they are trying to help those in needs, but on the other side, um, there is less solidarity uh, to the actually to the sources or to the possibilities of people who use drugs or people who are homeless. Like of course that they are outside if they don't have home and they c cannot go to quarantine. Like. There is, um, and I'm afraid of this, that this uh, hatred and this stigmatization will cause a lot of uh, harms to people who use drugs. Um, and of course, I agree with Pavel that probably we will fee feel it financially, like our, my organization, but I think that we will feel it the next year. The year 2021 because like right now we secure the funds more or less for the year of 2020 like mm. the biggest donors are already the contracts are some of them signed we already have the results so but i can i i feel that the next year will be really difficult for us to secure the funding uh because due to economical crisis there um, probably the budget for the social services will be Mm, smaller. Mm. So um, thank you very much and um, I think we could uh, speak about these issues for uh, hours. Uh, uh, actually our one hour is up mm -hmm. and uh, you see that it's, it's really short. One hour is really short and you have so uh, good people and so exciting uh, discussions. Uh, I think we need, will need a lot of solidarity in the future, that's uh, for sure. And uh, we, we will need people like you who are, uh, uh, who are taking the risks, who are going to the front lines and working with those people who are uh, living on the margins of society. So thank you very much, uh, Dominika, Pavel and David for being with us here today at this very first show of the Drug Reporter Stories from Frontline series. And thank you for all those who were watching us on uh, Facebook uh, live. Um, and please uh, uh, follow us on uh, social media. You follow the Drug Reporter uh, page on Facebook and Twitter, and you will find out when our next uh, uh, show will be. Probably we will speak with uh, Italian harm reductions next time, and that will be another interesting example because we know that uh, that country was uh, pretty badly hit by uh, the epidemic. So, uh, uh, and don't forget, keep social distancing, but uh, uh, stay solid, uh, keep solidarity uh, with people. Stay safe, take care, and uh, goodbye for now. Goodbye. Goodbye.